Is everyone excited about Passover this morning? <laughs> I've got a lot of things to cover, and it's going to be by the power and the grace of God that I do it. You know, one of the things that we need to do as we walk with God, there's a balance. And how many have seen churches and people go off the deep end one way or another? I have found that the truth of God is like a road, a journey that we take. And there's always a ditch on both sides the enemy puts in for us that anything taken to the extreme, you have problems, don't you? And in understanding our Hebraic heritage and some of the things God is doing, I have found that one ditch is rabbinical Judaism, that you can get so far out in, into a Jewish tradition that you lose Jesus in the mix. And I think one of the things that I'm hearing from uh, people in the Messianic community and the Christian Hebraicist community is that there are those that get so far out they end up denying Christ and becoming part of rabbinical Judaism. And then on the other side, we have paganized Christianity that has so paganized itself that it's no longer presenting the real Jesus. People think Jesus was raised in Detroit or something, you know, or, or maybe in the, the beaches of Southern California and that he has no Jewishness and there's so much paganism amalgamated into it that um, we have to wonder, is the real Jesus being preached in many corners? Because uh, some Jesuses, you know, you can do anything you want. You can, whatever sin, whatever, whatever floats your boat, it's okay with him. And how many know that isn't according to the Word of God? At the same time, uh, I'm really big on, on gathering intelligence. I want to know what's going on in the body. I want to, and I want to know what's, you know, there's, there, there, there are issues the body of Christ is facing all across the board. And there, there are several issues within Messianic Judaism that is, is alarming. Now, there's some of them that are doing awesome. I'm, I'm so proud of what they're doing. Uh, but some of them, Jesus is, or Yeshua, and I've actually had someone get upset that I say Jesus instead of Yeshua. How many of y'all are Gentiles? All right. My, my ministry is to teach Gentile, the Gentile church, their Hebraicness. And to do that, I've got to speak your language. Okay. And so I have some of them get mad at me because I, I don't say Yeshua all the time. I do when it's proper. And, and I say Jesus, and I have found out heaven recognizes Jesus just as much as it recognizes Yeshua. And so does the devil, yes. But there has been an alarming thing within some segments of Messianic Judaism that they have become Talmudic-centric. They go back in, into the Talmud rather than Moses. And there are things interwoven into Talmudic literature that actually that, that the rabbis put there to hedge their people from discovering Jesus. And so as they go further and further into that, Jesus becomes less significant, less significant, less significant, less significant. Uh, I have talked with uh, Messianic rabbis. I have talked with people like Dr. Marv Wilson at Gordon College that teaches on, you know, he, he's the author of Our Father Abraham. I got to sit with him at one of the yeshiva uh, that uh, Dr. John Gar had. And with almost tears in his eyes, you could see the distress on his face. He was sharing how this bright young believer but had never gotten a foundation in the word from the church where he was raised, went through his class, and then a year later he renounced Christ and became, uh, became this Orthodox Jew. And you, you could see the heartbreak in him. Guys, I mean, there, there are some things on the water right now that, that you know, if you're, just, if you're just dealing with your little group, you may not see. And God has enabled me. I've got people all the time send me, uh, send me literature, call me, ask me about things that are going on in their own movements. Uh, I get both within the academic circle and then in with the general body of Christ type of circle. And uh, there are sections of the Messianic movement that have so moved so far over into the ditch of rabbinical Judaism, they're now debating whether they want to maintain the deity of Christ. Because... Orthodox Judaism will accept them as long as they set aside the deity of Christ. And so we, we have that going on, and then we have the other going on, that we literally have squirrels in the pulpits preaching paganism and pseudo-psychology and calling it the kingdom of God. Uh, guys, if there was ever a need for balance, it is today. And in the midst of all this, and... Uh, let me write down, because, you know, sometimes when God gives you something, it's so good when you write it down. 
God told me, says, we need to keep the balance of Messiah and our Hebraic heritage if we are going to circumnavigate the last days. We need that. We need the balance. We need the balance. And in doing so, I, I try to, to do a lot of proper research. Sometimes I may make one statement, and you guys don't know that I may have put 100 hours of research into that one statement. And it's not just looking, and what, what I have found for, for me since I'm an academian, I don't look so much at what's in front of the guy's name. Reverend, rabbi, bishop. Because how many know that all three of those, you don't necessarily even have to have a proper ecclesiastical body to have that. Uh, that there are, there are, because you can legally in America, you can go ahead and, and, and incorporate your own church and ordain yourself. Or you can buy it online someplace sometimes. It's the same thing with bishop. Or it's even the same thing with rabbi. There are, there are different groups in, within the Messianic movement that their, their, their requirements are very strict. And I mean, you have to be fluent in Hebrew. You've got to be fluent in a lot of things before they'll let you put on rabbi. Uh, for some of them, all you have to do is memorize. You know, it's, it's, it's like the cantors. They memorize all the Hebrew. They can't speak it, but I mean, they can, they can rattle it off because they've memorized certain portions of it. And then there are some that can't even do that, that aren't a part of any ecclesiastical body within Messianic Judaism. They just go set up a synagogue someplace, and then they make themselves a rabbi. And so I don't look so much at what's in the front of the name. Being an academia, and I look at what's behind the name. MDiv, THD, PhD. Have they received the education they need so that they, can, so that they have been trained in, in ferreting out and going deep and, and, and that there's academic research? I, I love it. it and there, there are several uh, publications within the Messianic movement like Kesher, which is a wonderful academic-oriented Messianic Jewish publication. And so I love getting into those things. And at the same time, how many know that there are, there are things from traditional Christianity that are very powerful? Uh, there were wonderful things that Spurgeon wrote, that Matthew Henry wrote, that Adam Clark wrote, that Mc, uh, McLaren wrote, that McEachern wrote. And so we, we need to take all those in. And so I, I, what I do is I go into the academic side of things to make sure there's solid scholarship, Messianic Judaism, Christian Hebraicist, which I believe that's what I am. I'm not here to create a Messianic Jewish congregation. I'm like Paul, I'm called to the Gentiles, and so we are, we are Christian Hebraicists. We understand who Messiah is and our Hebraic heritage, and we maintain it in balance. And then I also pull from established Christian theologians. And so that's, that's, very, that's very proper to do that. And so I'm going to explain some things about the feasts and the purpose of the appointed times and how on some of them they're modified that Gentile believers will do it differently than Jewish believers. And I believe there is biblical precedent for it because there, there has been some concern. And I, you know, I thought it was enough. That I, don't want to do, I don't want to dishonor Jesus or anything, so we do it this way. Well, that isn't enough. I've got to go into detail because there has been some controversy in some places that has arisen. So I want to set the thing straight. I want you to get and crawl into the head of my clique. I know it's a very scary place. And, uh, and understand what, why I do what I do and how I do it. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And I want to start out with Colossians because of the predicament that the people in Colossians were in and understanding what was going on. You see, any time that you read the uh, epistles of Paul, Paul learned how to write epistles at the foot of, of Gamaliel, his mentor. And Gamaliel wrote epistles to solve problems. And I call it the four P's of understanding Paul's epistles. He had a persistent problem that precipitated the need for parchment. What does that mean? If it's like playing Jeopardy. If you don't really understand in every one of Paul's epistles, maybe there was only one or two or three issues that he was addressing in those epistles. Now, some of them were complicated. The book of Romans was written because of two issues. How I many of that's big issues, okay? But, it, but you miss the point of the book of Romans if you don't understand those two issues. The book of Galatians was written over one issue, circumcision. The book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians was written because of carnality that was manifest in their division among one another, that a guy was basically made his mother his wife, that, there, that then out of, out of that there was another uh, precipitating thing that the oracles at Delphi were beginning to 
infiltrate and begin to, to mess up a lot of the things in, in that congregation. And so it caused several problems that Paul had to deal with. They were messing up the way they were doing Passover slash communion. And so he had to set the record straight on that. They were misinterpreting the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He had to set the record straight on that. And he even had to set the, and, and establish some things for those at Corinth because if the, if the oracles of Delphi and those that were, were serving in, in the Dephelic temple, they would shave their heads showing that they were prostitutes. And so, you know, you're, if you're walking in Corinth and you see a woman with a shaved head, she was a temple prostitute. That's what you got for your tithe down there. And so when they were in the house of God, a guy walked in and everything in his culture says, this is what she is. Paul said, put, you know, put a veil on your head till your hair grows out. And he wasn't referring to all the doilies. Everybody goes around, you know, women have to have doily on her head. That's not necessarily what he's talking about. It was so that they would not confuse you. He, and even out of the oracles of Delphi came the problem that they were saying there was no resurrection, that Jesus didn't resurrect. That all precipitated out of those three or four different problems that were dealing in the Corinth church. And you don't, you don't use chapters and verses when you read the problem because they weren't there. Paul didn't put them there. And so in rabbinical fashion, he may deal with a little bit about Passover here and a little bit about Passover here and over here because he's interweaving it. It's all one letter dealing with those two, three, or four issues. And so unless you do that and you try to divide it up, it's like the sound bites today on television that the politician says, we're going to turn left, and by the time they get through editing, he's telling everybody to turn right. We don't want sound bites of the kingdom. We, and so a lot of times whenever I sit and read an epistle, I try to read it all the way through to try to get the general understanding with those, with those problems in mind. And so I've said all that to go into Colossians, okay? Now, in Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 16 and 17, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holy days of the new moon or the Sabbath. Verse 17 is, uh, is important. Which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, to understand fully what he was talking about here, because you read a lot of Christian commentators, and they say it was Judaizers that was the problem. Everybody was trying to make them Jews, and, and he was having to go in to correct all that. But there's a lot of things, if you read above it and below it in the Scripture, that Jews would never do. Jews don't worship angels. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things. He even deals with that they, they will for, forbid you to eat clean meats. That word, uh, uh, eat meat, in the, in the Greek is broma, which means Levitically approved foods. They're, they're going to try to pressure you to quit eating biblically clean and eat other things. But you see, there were the, the, the Colossians, because of where they lived, Colossia was, and, it, and its heyday, was the place of academic and spiritual learning for the pagans. It was a place of great uh, both Greek and Roman philosophy. And so it, although it was in its decline, that was, that was, that was what it was known for. Gentiles, it was, it was their, their height. It's almost like going into some cities where you would maybe have Harvard and, and Yale and all that, but now it's in its decline, but they're, they're still all academic airheads, okay, kind of thing going on. You know what I mean? You know, they can't say anything that doesn't have 14 syllables in it. They, it's almost watching the, like watching the Big Bang Theory. They can't grasp common things because their, their head is so far in, in quantum physics and everything else. I, as an academian, I love Big Bang Theory. Just, it, so, what's scary is sometimes I see myself at times. Had no clue of common sense because I was so caught up in, in other things. And so they, they, had, they had several different facets going on. They had the, the Gentiles around them that were pagan that took great prestige in what they taught in their philosophies and their religious practice. And they were putting pressure on the Colossians for being too Jewish. Then you have the Jewish community over here that's looking at them, and from what Paul had trained them, there had been a modification of the way they did some of these things. And so they're putting pressure on them. You're not being Jewish enough. Kind of sounds like being at biblical life. And then you have the, you have the third one. You have the Gnostics that were amalgamating uh, paganism and, and Christianity and trying to bring it together. I mean, they had made Constantine proud. Well, they were shooting at them too. And so Paul was basically saying, stick with what I gave you, how I taught you to do the feast, how I taught you to do the, the, these things. Don't, don't let the pressure of these two groups that were putting immense pressure on them, don't let them do it. Stick with what I gave you. 
because that was his ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. He had to ferret out some things, and he had to figure out by, by what Messiah had done, what the, the ways that they should do it, which were a little bit different than the ways that the, the Gentiles do it. Because when I, sell about pre, when I celebrate Passover, it's not about coming out of Egypt. It's because there was a Savior, there was the Lamb of God who died on the cross. And let me tell you something, if you call yourself a Messianic community and you're not preaching the cross on Passover, something wrong. Right. Something is wrong. And so that, that is the, the kind of the thing that Colossians is dealing with in the book of Colossians. He's having to deal with all these different issues by the pressure that was being put on these Gentiles trying to simply be faithful to what Paul had taught them to do. But he brings out something very significant. The feasts are a shadow, and even Sabbath is a shadow of Jesus. If the way that we do the feasts is not Jesus-centric, you're not doing the feast in the light of the cross and in the light of what Messiah had done. And he says, that, he says but we have the body. They're, they're still messing with the shadow, but we have the body. But let me tell you something. In some areas, we don't have the body, yet we still have the shadow. In the spring feast, we got the body. Okay? We know that he was the Passover lamb. We know that he was the unleavened bread. We know that he was the first fruit. He was the, the first of many brethren raised from the dead. We know that. We're all, we also understand we're still in the manifestation of the realization of Shavuot. That's still going on. Of the power of the Holy Spirit coming to live the word and to be a witness. Now exactly how the fall feasts are going to all play out, it's, there's still a lot of shadow. Isn't there? You know, so it's almost like going on a date that, you know, your, your Aunt Martha set up for you, and the girl's not quite around the corner of the building, but you see her shadow. But how many know that once she comes around the corner, there's no guessing anymore? For you are her. <laughs> and so he, he's kind of dealing with that typology. Now, I want to read something from the commentary uh, by Dr. David Sternis from the Jewish New Testament commentary. And uh, I, I respect his scholarship. He's also the one who put together the entire complete Jewish Bible. Uh, very accurate. He brings in a lot of the Hebraic understanding and the Jewish understanding that we have been so far removed from as we read the Word of God. Really helps you do it. But he also put together for the Jewish community and for the Gentile community alike a, a New Testament commentary written from a rabbi's perspective. And I, I really esteem the brother. And I want you to read some of the things that he says about uh, the shadow, but we have Christ here. For Gentiles, however, Jewish practices are in most cases nothing more than a shadow, in as far as they do not arise out of their own national experience. The exception would be a Gentile believer who was involved himself with Jewish life on a daily basis and absorbed naturally elements of the Jewish lifestyle without ascribing to them value for salvation or sanctification, since this contradicts the teachings of Galatians and Romans. God gave the Torah to Israel in the extent of Israel's uh, peoplehood, and its, detailed reflect, and its details reflect what God knew Israel needed in order to grow spiritually. But rules concerning kashrut and the celebration are external impositions for non-Jews. Messianic Jews, since they are a part of the Jewish people, have reason enough for observing these rules, which for them are pleasant shadows, even as through trust in Yeshua, they have the substance as well. But since these shadows are irrelevant to Gentiles, since God did not give these commands to Gentiles, Shaul urges the Colossians not to be bound legalistically to them. For that matter, he elsewhere urges Jews as well not to fall into the trap of perverting the Torah into a legalistic system. So he, 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 him as a, as a messianic rabbi uh, of, of real scholarship understood that there was, there's going to be a difference in the way that Gentiles and Jews will celebrate the feast. Especially ours, since we're, we're all Gentiles here. It's almost like being in Corinth, or almost being like in Ephesians, or Ephesus. Now, we would do it differently if I was a Messianic Jewish rabbi, and we had, we had Jewish believers in, we would amalgamate more of them together. And what, what upsets some believers, and they can't really quite understand, is if, if 
we don't have that, uh, that Jewish tradition because of our heritage, there's some things we're going to do different. And I, I want to deal with that this morning because I want to keep the balance. I want to show the fulfillment of the spring feast in the life of Jesus and examine the body of what they revealed to us. Now, I want to go into Leviticus chapter 23, verse 14, because it, it deals with an issue about the feasts and about how long they're supposed to be done. And this is another situation in which the English does not do us justice. And how many know that even for all of us here, there are nuances within the English language that confound the most educated at times? Because there are nuances. And sometimes those nuances change from generation to generation. You know, 30 years ago, if you said, I'm bad, somebody would want to shoot you. Now you're cool, you know. And uh, we, we deal with all these different things that go on in pop culture. But that's all part of the English language. They're still having to every year modify the English dictionary because of our variance of uses. And it says, if, let me pick up verse 14 here. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched nor corn nor grain ears until the same self day that you, were, that you brought an offering unto the Lord. And it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in your dwelling. And what we see in all of the feasts is that there, this word forever is there. And so we automatically perceive that it is forever, yet I'm going to show you some things even, even coded into what the Apostle Paul wrote that he understood that forever Hebraically is not necessarily forever. Uh, this word is olam in the Hebrew, and if you look it up like in Strong's or in Thayer's, or, or in Strong's, uh, it says long duration, antiquity, uh, fu uh, futurity, Forever, ever, everlasting, evermore, perpetual, old, ancient world, ancient time, uh, continuous existence, perpetual. But there's a variant to it, and so I, I want to little, dig a little bit deeper. I like going into Cassinius, or I like going into uh, some of the bigger lexicons that have more depth in the definition. And Cassinius is extremely well uh, respected. In fact, when there was talk about Cassinius being taken out of print and simply going with Brown Drivers Briggs, people like Dr. Koch went up and bought every one of them they found because, you know, he's like an NRA member with their gun. You're going to pry that gun out of my, out of my cold, dead hand. Dr. Koch, I guarantee you, you're going to pry Cassinius out of his hand after he's dead. You know, he'll probably have one, he'll have a Bible and a Cassinius in his coffin with him when he passes away. Uh, but Cassinius brings out something very interesting. He says, and, and if you look at the definition, uh, if you watch it on video, it has PR period. That means primary. So its primary definition is what is hidden, especially hidden time, long or the beginning or end of that which is uncertain or else not defined. So by default, unless there's something in either the context, application, or the prophetic flow within the Word of God to make it, to make it eternal, then what God is saying is that there is something hidden that we know the beginning of it, but we don't quite know the end of it. There's something hidden with it, especially with the feast. If they are shadows of Messiah, when the shadow comes, you start dealing with the body and not the shadow. And so we, we have to really look at it in context. And so as I looked at all this, what I got was something was hidden in the feast. You are to do them until the hidden has been revealed. As long as the shadow keep doing them, but once the body comes, center up on what is no longer hidden. Because when I, when I honor the spring feast, I want to make sure that I never go back into the left side of the ditch and, and start uh, not looking at what Christ has done and go, and go back to simply what was done in Egypt because a greater truth came. Not only did Egypt happen, but the cross happened. But the thing we need to ask is, okay, is there, is there um, signs given to us in the prophets that maybe this is true, that maybe as, as we progress in redemptive history, especially in the last days, will it come a time that no other celebrations of feasts or maybe God reduces the numbers that are done? Is there anything in the prophets to show that? I want to go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. Now, this is talking about the millennial reign. If you have a good study Bible, uh, you actually go up a few verses, whether it is a Thomas Nelson study Bible, the open Bible, uh, any, any decent study Bible will say this is the millennial reign of Christ this is talking about. 
Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and shall keep the feast of what? Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not go up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. How many keep on? You know who Jesus is? He's the king, the Lord of hosts. That's all capitalized. He is Yahweh of hosts. Even upon them shall no rain be. And if the family of Egypt go not up uh, and come not and have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that do not come up to the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be a punishment of Egypt and a punishment of all nations that come up not to the Feast of Tabernacles. During the millennial reign, how many know Passover, every shadow has been fulfilled? Shavuot, every shadow has been fulfilled. It's done. <laughs> Feast of Trumpets. We've already had the last trump. Everybody come up out of the grave. That one's taken care of. The Day of Atonement. The king came back and he koshered this planet and everything that was not humble before him, he koshered. He cut off. So the only last one that they're still dwelling in is tabernacles. And so they will be celebrating Sabbath. But instead of coming up three times a year, the whole world will come up once a year. And if they don't honor the God King, they're going to be no rain. And then there's a special one on Egypt. <laughs> that not only do you get no rain, but you get a plague. We, we see that pattern. Well, is there another one? Because it has to be by two or three witnesses. Let's go to Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 22 and 23. You see, part of the, part of the thing of, of thinking Hebraically and, and thinking Jewishly is you have to see patterns. You, you, you have to see shadows. You have to see patterns. And sometimes you need to learn to think with both hands. Is it A or is it B? Yes. That, that was very hard for this Greco-Roman mind. I remember, I remember one time sitting with Dwight Pryor at Yeshiva back in 91, 92, and him and I were dealing with an issue, and he said, Mike, he said, you, wanna, you want me to say, is it A or is it B? He said, but Hebraically, all I can say is yes. I went, <laughs> I mean, he could see the smoke beginning to roll in my brain. Does not compute, does not compute, does not compute. But we need to learn to think Hebraically. It's not linear logic, it's block logic. For as the new heavens and the new earth. Now how many know you can find that in the book of the end of the book of Revelation? New heaven, new earth, old things have passed away, behold, all things come new. Shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. No other feasts. They're all completely fulfilled. The Sabbath is a twofold feast. It is about the millennial reign, which we already saw has come to pass, but it's also a creation principle. It is first creation, then it is millennial. And so how many know that even if we're sitting in a new heaven and new earth, we got the creator of the new heaven and earth sitting there, so it is still a creation principle. And so we will be celebrating the new moons, which I can't wait to see, guys. You know why? Because if you read all the prophets, there's no sun, but we got a moon. There's no night, but we're going to be able to tell when there's a new moon. Wrap that around your head. Yeah. And although on the moon there's going to be a shadow, but nowhere else. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. I'll probably sit there and there'll be another saying said, blows your mind, doesn't it? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's going to be cool. So let's look at Passover. I want to go to Matthew chapter 26. Now this is after Jesus uh, celebrated Passover with his disciples. And what gets people is they, they don't understand the tradition back then because one of the things that I have been wrestling with is I have come to the conviction that even communion is not an ordinance of the church. It's an ordinance of the home. Because with Passover, it was done in the home. The head of the household did it. 
And there, there is no delineation or no separation anywhere in Scripture that you can really allude to. It was the Catholic Church because they believed that their priesthood replaced the Levitical and, and Aaronic priesthood. In fact, if one of the, one of the, the uh, staffs the Pope has, has Aaron's rod that budded as a part of the staff. And they believe that they were able to, every, every day when they do Mass, they believe that they're crucifying, they, they've been given supernatural power to re-crucify Jesus, and that the elements of communion become his literal blood and his literal body, as if, they, as if they would have brought him into the room and crucified him on the cross every single day. And because of they said it was an ordinance of the church, we have never become Hebraic enough to realize it was an ordinance of the home, that the, in the home Passover is to be done, in the home communion can be done every Friday night, as the, you can take the bread and the wine and you can, do, you can do communion in the home to remember what Jesus has done for And it, it should be done at home because spirituality is first done in the home, then it's done in the church. If everything's in the church, I have emasculated every male in this place and say, I have taken the place, I am the husband of every wife here. How many know that's just wrong? <laughs> but yet we spiritually do it, and, and there's a certain anger in the heart of the men that they know that something's amiss with church. I have no place unless I'm called to get behind the pulpit. I ain't got nothing to do unless I want to go and park cars or something, you know. Well, your first of what you do for the Lord is in the home, and then you serve in the church where God opens up. And opens up a, a position for you. So let's look at this. And it says in verse 26, And they were eating. Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup after thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of my, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. And I say unto you that I will not drink forth of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drank it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sang a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And we know the, what, what happens after he went out there, that, uh, that he began to pray, and, and he had, was really wrestling with some issues. But we don't understand he had went through the basic Passover Seder, and this is an afikoman that they would use, something like it. It has the, the three pieces of bread. There are actually three chambers in here to put matzah bread. And so after, after the supper, it is, it is traditional many times that you have a piece of, of, of the bread for dessert. And so he was reaching in, and everybody was expecting dessert, and he reaches in to chamber number two, and he pulls out Isaac, and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. The unleavened bread, this is my body. And I love to use... Unleavened bread. I mean, what the church is where they have the little round little discs. That also comes from the Catholic Church. That's a sun disc. Doesn't represent Jesus at all. There are two things about this piece of matzah that you can readily see. How many can see the stripes? How many know that there were 39 stripes upon his back? By his stripes we are healed. His hands and his feet and his side were pierced. What's the bread? Pierced. He took this out and he said, now this is my body which is broken for you. He broke it and began disseminated among them. And, he, and what I believe that he was doing in this, and, and guys, Messianic rabbis and Christian Hebraicists wrestle with just exactly what this meant. Was he adding the reality of what he did to the end of Passover so that they could incorporate into it the type and shadow, the prophetic significance of what he was going to do, or was he interpreting Passover and reducing it down to the bread and the wine? Interesting question, isn't it? Well, what's the answer, Mike? Yes. Yes. Because we're going to see in a minute that if we were a Messianic Jewish congregation, we would go through a proper Passover Seder. And it doesn't, it doesn't last four hours. You go back to the Word. There's only a couple elements that you use. We don't do the, the embellishment. You go back to Moses. And then you end it with communion. And you preach the cross. For the Gentile, I never came out of Egypt. 
I never had the stripes of Pharaoh on my back. But when I celebrate communion, I realize that there were stripes upon his back for me. And so I do it a little bit different because I believe that Jesus began to, at, the, at, the, at this Last Supper, Jesus began to stand in, the, in his priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and began to set a new shadow into place because the shadow, just like how the, the Passover shadow prepared them for what he was going to do. How so? How many know that he was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God? that he gave his life for us. God even erected a doorpost on planet Earth and put the blood over the doorposts. <laughs> you know, that type and shadow prepared them so that because there is an element, there is a concept of the Moadim, that there, then there's another word translated that also ties into Olam. It's a divine rehearsal. There is something hidden that I'm rehearsing for something to come to pass because God always teaches us the end from the beginning. He encodes things in the beginning and has us rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it, and rehearse it so that when the real comes... And the date comes around the corner, I know what to do. I can recognize it. And part of the problem, even by that time within, within Judaism, is they had added so many other things to it that many of the Jews missed the body when it came. Okay. And so if we don't have it right, and we don't give the, the new shadow picture that Messiah gave us, maybe this picture is needed for the last days. I mean, they could have never imagined with the lamb and with the bitter herbs and with all these things that God was going to send the lamb that he promised to Abraham, that he was going to send him and die. They didn't understand that, but as they rehearsed it, so there may be elements of, of, of communion that we're going to need that as that day approaches, we can put two and two together and go, aha! Yeah. That if we, go, if we go too far back toward Egypt, yeah. we're going to miss the types and shadows that we need as a body. That's good. And I, I'm not dismissed, because I, I, don't, I don't know of very many ministries that harp on keeping the commandments as much as I do. But I also know that I've got to use, I've got to be, I've got to understand what God is saying prophetically, what God is saying through proper academic research, and bringing in all that intelligence for us to move forward. Now, I want to go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Because I think Paul is kind of giving us a sign for the, for the Gentile believer. that They're going to be doing it a little bit different. And sometimes you just kind of read right over the words and you don't really understand. Uh, verse 23 just jumped out to me this morning. For I have received of the Lord, not of Peter, not of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that which I received of the Lord I delivered also unto you. We need to understand that Paul never went to Jerusalem to consult with the apostles until he had to go up for the council of Jerusalem when they were dealing with all the Gentiles coming in. He never went. In Galatians, he said, I never went up, except I went up there and, I, and to make sure that what I was doing wasn't in vain. I explained to them what I was doing and how I was doing it and laid it all before them. And they said it was okay. He, that, that, that's expounded in. So, I mean, that, that one statement of Galatians, because some commentators try to say, we don't know if he wrote it before uh, the Council of, of Jerusalem or after the Council of Jerusalem. That very statement dates it after. He already went up there. He explained everything. And they said, okay, for the way that you're having the Gentiles do it, that's great. But he also indicated that, that because no man taught him, that there was one that he knew that was caught up to the third heaven, that Jesus himself taught him. And that's what we, in, the, in theological circles, we call that the Pauline revelation of what Jesus taught him, that Jesus was able to take him because of his academic background, probably a whole lot deeper and a whole lot further uh, than he could the, the other apostles who were mere fishermen and different things, as well as the distinctiveness of his calling because he was called to the Gentiles. And so Peter is looking at this and saying, what the, have you ever guys read Galatians? <laughs> Peter looks at him and says, this guy will fry your brain. 
but I know him and I know his heart. It's hard to understand. I can't wrap my Jewish head around this Jewish boy trying to deal with all these Gentiles. I'm glad Peter was the apostle to the Jews. He was given the keys of the kingdom. He preached the first inaugural message of the gospel after the resurrection to the Jews. And then he went down to Cornelius' house, whipped out his key, and began to open it up for the Gentiles. And then he said, Paul, here's your deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very gratefully. So what, what Paul is sharing here with him was given to him by direct revelation. Uh, and very possibly when he was caught up into the third heaven, and, and most, most commentators believe it happened after, after he got out of Damascus, it's like, you know, it's like, okay, Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, and he went on the back side of, of Saudi Arabia, and he studied for three years before he started preaching. He said, I've got to rework my rabbinical theology. <laughs> and so he spent three years in prayer and in study, and it was most likely during that time that he had a visitation from the Lord. And, then, and uh, you know, it's like, Paul, yeah, we've got some teaching to do, okay? And, and so he did it, and that's why, he, that's why he was so eminently prepared to teach the Gentiles, as well as under the school of Gamaliel. He was taught in Greek philosophy. He was taught the Greek language, and he understood it. But what Gamaliel would do is he would teach Greek philosophy to him after he taught Torah, and then he would say, here's where the Greeks, ah, oh, they messed it all up. And so, <laughs> and so he, he, he had that part of his training uniquely qualified because of, of his mentor. So then he goes on, as he says, now, he says, the same night in which the Lord was, be, uh, the, the Jesus on the same night, let me go back, verse 23, blah, blah, blah. For I have received of the Lord, which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, why does he say that? Because what Jesus did, any time that you have been betrayed in your life, that was nailed to the cross too. That was part of the stripes. It started with the betrayal. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same matter, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as often as you drank it in remembrance of me and then he makes this statement for often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the lord's death till that's the same concept in the greek as olam except it's not so hidden when you take communion you do show the lord's death until he comes which means it may be different what we do after he comes It's right there in plain English. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Well, once he comes, we, don't have to know, we no longer have to show his death. It's that thing of Olam that there is something hidden. There's an expiration date. Now, the expiration date is not fully over for Passover. When Jesus came, it's the 2080 principle. 80% of the spring feasts were fulfilled the first time he came. There are some types and shadows and patterns of the deliverance and of the story that you've got to overlay over the book of Revelation to understand it. And uh, Dr. Justin, or Juster, did a wonderful work in his, in his book on Passover, the key to the book of Revelation. Very outstanding book. But at the same time, when he came the first time, he fulfilled 20% of the fall feasts. He was born the first day of tabernacles. He was circumcised on the eighth great day. God, Emmanuel, God with us, he came to tabernacle among us. That was the first minor fulfillment of the millennial reign of the king coming and tabernacling with us. At the same time that he was the Passover lamb and the, door, and the lamb's blood was over the doorpost, he became our atonement, which was from the day of atonement. He became our atonement. But the fullness of it is not going to be fulfilled of the Day of Atonement until the Valley of Armageddon. Where that same lamb who was the king, the lamb who is the lion is going to come back. And that which has not humbled itself and received the gospel message before God will be cut off. That's one of the things of the Day of Atonement. If you go into the Day of Atonement haughty and you have not humbled yourself before the, the hand of Almighty God, you're cut off. Can you see what I'm talking about? So there's, there's this 80, 20. So there's, there's some things yet to be fulfilled, yet there's some things not. And so we, we just keep doing what we're doing, but I think Messiah interpreted for us and gave an option for the Gentiles so that we could identify with it. I don't identify with Egypt, but I sure identify with sin. Don't you? 
And so for a Jewish believer, it is proper for them to do the, uh, a, a, a biblical Haggadah for Passover and then end it with communion and preach the cross. That's the proper way to do it. You say, well, well when you say, I don't have to do the first part, but do the latter part. Is there any other uh, biblical precedent for this? Yes, circumcision. God said circumcision was olam too. And he used to get real hot about it. You read in the Exodus story that after they got out of, e after they got out of Egypt, that God came down and God was going to kill Moses. <laughs> you know, I can see maybe killing Aaron, but killing Moses? <laughs> you know? And, and so his wife goes and circumcises their sons and throw their foreskin at his feet and says, well, now to me you're a bloody man. God was going to come kill him because he hadn't circumcised his own children. How many of that is serious about circumcision? And we also do not take lightly what the Jews had to endure an, under Antiochus Epiphanes during the intertestamental periods between Malachi and, and Matthew. That when, when, he invaded, when he invaded Judah, if you circumcised your children, he would, he would go and kill them. He forbid circumcision, and he, he demanded that they eat pork. And so I mean, those are kind of two sore points with the Jewish people. And you have to deal with those in the New Testament. And what's amazing to me is there, no, there is no uproar ever of the Jews getting mad that Christians were eating pork. You know why? Because they weren't. How's that for CSI investigation for you? Okay. But there was great controversy over circumcision. And what's amazing to me in some messianic circles today, they're still debating whether they should require Gentiles to be circumcised before they can be full participants of their congregation. And, and there's, other, there's other of us that are, that are Hebraicists or even Messianic Jews saying, didn't Paul cover this 2,000 years ago? So we're, 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 that's the, that leaning too far the other way. And it's the same with unleavened bread. I want to go back to Leviticus 23 and I want to show you a couple of things. Am I making sense this morning? I don't want it to be scary in the mind of Mike Lake. I want it to be clear. Because some, sometimes it takes me a while to rattle everything into place. Starting in verse 4, And these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month of the even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye shall not, ye must eat unleavened bread. Now, there's some other, there's other things. And the first day ye shall have a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work, and ye shall offer offerings made by fire unto the Lord seven days. How many in the Messianic community offers fire unto the Lord seven days? Don't. We don't. In, in fact, since the, the book of Hebrews says that there had needed to be a change in the Torah because we went back to the priesthood of Melchizedek rather than the Aaronic priesthood, Levitical priesthood. And the, uh, and the sacrifices we ought to offer now are the sacrifice of praise because Jesus is our sacrifice. So, you know, we don't do the one, but everybody wants to go back and, and eat the unleavened bread, which I want to deal with. And all, even the, the thing of, of God has a sense of humor because I was dealing with, you know, on, on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do any servantile work. That means that which is commerce. It doesn't mean the, the things you've got to do to take care of your family. Could you imagine a mother with a baby and the baby's diaper is full and she says, you're on your own, it's the Sabbath? <laughs> no mama would do that because they know but they're, 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 on the Sabbath whether it's a high Sabbath or regular Sabbath you do not do that which you make a living from you, you do not do commerce but in Jewish tradition in this the, the simple instruction is you offer an offering by fire for seven days and you eat unleavened bread you did not, you did, you not, did not go down to quick stop in, in the Holy Land or in Egypt and buy a pack of brewer's yeast that leaven was naturally occurring from exposure to the world. And we get so busy doing everything else, we don't take that into consideration. It's, it's long-term exposure to the world and the worldly system that causes leaven that I've got to guard myself from. <laughs> that, uh, that sinks in. And all this other stuff, 
of, of making sure that you, know, you can tell you know, about you know, the need to get rid of sin, yada, yada, but you can get so busy doing those things, you don't obey the simple instruction of the Word of God, level one. And yet everybody is so busy running that you miss the type and shadow. You miss the body of the shadow. You miss what God's really dealing with here because it was more than just remembering that they got out of Egypt with haste. Uh, Pastor Oddhouse and I were talking that when you read Exodus, God told them a couple weeks before, you get a lamb, you're going to do this, you're going to have your shoes on. They had plenty of time to have unleavened, or have unleavened bread. If you knew two weeks ahead of time when you were about when you were going to go, you kind of knew. And how many know that fixing a lamb takes a while? And they were required to have that lamb in their house for four days. They examined that lamb for four days before they slaughtered it for the dinner to make sure that it was perfect. How long was Jesus preaching? Three and a half years. Also, there's also a type in shadow that Jesus came in the fourth day to give his life, the, the end of the fourth millennium. All this is typing shadows in there. And we miss all that if we get so caught up in all these other things. But I want to show you from Scripture where Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because with me, guys, I could eat this for a week. I can go without bread for a week. You know, same with Mary. She's went on a diet. She could have no bread or yeast for six months. When she went on a life force diet. That's not the issue. The issue is, I'm not going to go back and try to do something that Jesus has already done. Right. And, and try, to, uh, try to undo or ignore a, a full manifested, the body of it. I'm not going to go back and play with the shadow when I've got the full body. And w since we don't understand this, I don't want to take away from anything what he's done. That's why when you do a Passover Haggadah, you better make sure that you end up preaching the cross and you take communion at the end. Otherwise, you have trampled under the blood of Christ. I'm going to get letters on that, but hey, I get letters on everything else. Okay. But I'm going to show you where Jesus fulfilled unleavened bread. Are you ready? We're going to go on a journey. Let's go to John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35. Now, this is another problem sometimes when, you, when, you, when we pull snippets out of the Word and just look at the addresses. How many know that chapter and verse is handy because it helps you find? If we didn't have chapters and verses and I was trying to find something in Isaiah, and I said, oh, right about the middle... <laughs> I mean, it would be real difficult. So addresses are handy. But though the addresses are not divinely inspired, the words are. Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And we say, okay, what, what precipitated this whole argument? Well, he fed them and multiplied bread and fish. Right? Okay. Okay. But let's go back to verses 3 and 4. I want to show you something. It wasn't just the bread and the fish. He did that strategically then to get another truth to them. And when Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. He did this right before Passover. He connected it to Passover. And he said, I am the bread come down from heaven. Been there all the time. That's the King James Version. We know that was the version that Moses used, so that's, it's, you know, at least if you watch the Charlton Heston version of, uh, of Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. No. How many know that uh, <laughs> Moses carried around a very heavy Hebrew Bible <laughs> that was just being started to be written? Jesus connected himself both to the Passover and the manna God gave to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Note, during the time, this is something to think about. How long were they in the wilderness? Forty years. The manna, you could grind up as flour and you could bake with it. You could do a lot of things with it. And so when it came time, the, or besides what was in Egypt when they were in the wilderness, they took manna, ground it up, and made matzah out of it. 
That's going to hit here in a minute. This is matzo bread. Okay, this, this is the unleavened matzo bread. Okay. Chuck's still catching up a little bit on... I haven't taken him fully through Hebraic 101 yet. Th this is matzo bread. Okay, and the easiest way to remember this, there is a song on Jib Jeb says, matzah, it tastes like the box it came in, matzah, because this one has salt, so it's a little bit better. This, this is matzah bread, this is unleavened bread. They took the manna, and by the working of their hands, they ground it up. They baked it, oh, wow. they pierced it, and they striped it for 40 years oh, my word. in the wilderness. And Jesus comes down, and he says, I'm the bread come down from heaven. I am the manna come down from heaven. Not only was he the manna come down from heaven, but by the hand of the Jews, he was ground down. He was striped. He was pierced. He was broken and hung on the cross. How many know you cannot get more fulfilled than that? And the, and the, 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 the power of it, if, and for some of them, I think it hit them after they got home. They saw him crucified. They got home and they, because they, they, it was, he died before they were actually doing Passover because the high priest was sacrificing all the lambs so that the people would have time to take them home and to cook them. And then he did the one for Israel, the very last one. He said, it is finished. About the time he did the one for Israel so that it could be prepared for his household, Jesus was saying, it, was, it is finished. And so they get home. And can you imagine those who were not blinded they got this and say, I just saw this on the cross. I saw the matzah and I saw the Lamb of God on the cross. He fulfilled that. Now I want to take it a step further. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't know about you guys, I'm having fun this morning. Sometimes we read over stuff, but call, Paul, when you're writing an epistle and you're dealing with several issues, it was standard rabbinical methodology to interweave, and as you're touching, when you touch on one thing, you're weaving into something else you were going to touch on to try to link them all together. And so he is linking together some of the things in chapter 5 with what he was going to deal with in chapter 11. Starting in verse 6, your glory is not good. They were glorying in their sin, and they thought they had freedom in Christ to do it. And his, his instruction was, you know what, that guy that won't repent is glorying in this stuff. I'm turning him over his body for the destruction of Satan. Kick him out. And he said, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old lump, that ye may have a new lump, as ye are unleavened. As ye are unleavened unleavened, as ye are unleavened, as ye are unleavened. When I got saved, I got unleavened. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. right there. Yeah. For even Christ, our Passover, is, is sacrificed for us. The Apostle Paul, right there connected, he said, you don't know on the cross, you saw both the matzo bread and the lamb yeah. at the cross at the same time. And now you're one with him. Yeah, I catch up. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or, or uh, wickedness, but with the leaven bread of sincerity and truth. There's the leaven bread that for seven days the Christian is supposed to eat sincerity and truth. You see, the first four days before Passover... I need to go back and review the Gospels and review Jesus so that I know that I know that I know that he was truly the Lamb of God. And then I spend the next seven days making sure every place in me is striped and pierced. Galatians 2.20. Let's jump there real quick. I'm gonna show you. I just got a couple more verses and we're, we're going to be through. 
But I, I knew I needed to do this all in one shot so that you didn't get lost in the translation, okay? Or the transition. Come on. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I live now, or now live, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am the unleavened. And Christian, that fe it, it talks about that I'm going to be offering up offerings by fire. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's not so much just eating unleavened bread. It's not about sweeping your house. It's looking to your life, and anything that doesn't line up with this gets burned out of your life. You start making some offerings. I've got unresentment in my heart. I've got unforgiveness in my heart. I've got malice in my heart. I'm going, I'm going to the Passover blood of the Lamb, and I'm putting the blood over that, and I'm bringing it. It's, it's a time of examination. Yet we get so busy trying to do it the way they do out of Egypt, there's no application to what we do. And, and in fact, I, I've had some that the, the malice was manifest in their, their interpretation of my understanding. Not only recently, but in the past. I've had some upset people. Well, you're not doing it exactly the way the Jews do it. No, I don't. I don't wear a kippah. I got a, I got, I got a natural one you can kind of see up there anyway, but I don't need one. It's never commanded to Moses. I, I don't wear a talit all the time. I don't go speaking Hebrew all the time because y'all don't speak Hebrew. I can bring out what it means and teach you some things about it, but if this was a Jewish congregation, how many know Mike Lake would have to really brush up on his Hebrew? Okay. Now, I got one last one because I'm not done with the unleavened bread yet. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. You see, sin used to be leaven. Lucifer introduced bad leaven into the world at the fall. Now Jesus makes an announcement in Matthew 13, 33. Another parable he said unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. Now I bet when, the minute he said that, every Jew's eyebrows went up and said, what? But he's getting ready to introduce another bacteria into the world. Which a woman took. What was he born of? A woman. Virgin. And hid in how many measures of meal? Three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. Jesus was born of a woman. And since Lucifer began this thing in a tree, he finished it in a tree. Lucifer introduced a new ideology that had a leaven that would always take you away from God. And Jesus came with a heavenly leaven that when he was in the ground for three days, the unleavened bread rose. <laughs> with a new leaven. This one is leaven on steroids because you can be of the world, but by the manner that believers live, if they're guys, if they're doing it right, the way that I live, I begin infecting those around me. Yeah, not puffed up, it's edifying. Now, when believers aren't identifying with this, and don't go through the feast and make sure at least, I mean, you do it twice a year. You make sure there's no leaven in your heart of the world during the seven days of unleavened bread, and you make sure there's nothing anywhere else before you get to the Day of Atonement. You have two years of balancing yourself so that you don't get puffed up and you don't get arrogant and you don't get weird and you don't get wild and you don't get screwy. Because let me tell you something. There's been more people driven from church than there has been brought into church. There's been more pimple wounded 
in church than have been wounded down the barn. They fight physically down there, and yet there are more wounds in the church from the church because we, we let too much of the other leaven, and we don't follow the cycle to get rid of it. Yeah. And see, that's what you teach your children. Is that, well, what do I teach my children? I teach them Jesus is the unleavened bread, that by his stripes I am healed. He was pierced for my transgressions. And because he is unleavened, we're going to spend the next week looking at our family and looking at our life. And we're going to offer up every day. When we end the day, every day our family is going to gather together, and we're going to say, what leaven do we need to burn tonight? Because I got seven days of offerings by fire. Burn, baby, burn. When I do that right, I get it right. Okay. Can I end with the last one? Just take me just a second. First fruits. Let's go to, first, or let's go to John chapter 10. See, first fruits is that there's a barley harvest and then there's a wheat harvest. And so um, uh, uh, right after the Passover, the first Sabbath after the Passover, you have that Sunday morning, the first day of the, of the week, you have a first fruits office where they, they lift up the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the bundles of barley as a first fruit offering unto the Lord. Now this is after Jesus resurrected in John chapter 20, verses uh, 16 and 17. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary was grieving because she didn't know where he was and, and all this. And, and even when Jesus appeared to her, he didn't know, she didn't know him until he said her name. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, and she returned, and she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, what, uh, what, uh, where, what is, which is to say, Master, Jesus said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my God, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my God, and my Father, and your Father, to my God, and to your God. He is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. When he rose from the dead, he said, now don't contaminate me, because I'm getting ready to go, I'm getting ready to go to the Father. When he went up there, he took his blood, and he put it on the mercy seat of heaven, the book of Hebrews tells us. He actually, he actually collected his blood, took it, and put it there. But he doesn't stop there. He says, Father, behold, I am the firstborn of many brethren. I am the firstborn. Yeah. I'm the down payment. Yeah. Because I have been loosed in the earth, and my leaven has been loosed in the earth. You got a family coming, Daddy. Yeah. Paul even alludes to this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Yeah. Jesus is the first fruits. Yeah, sure Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> so when he comes to collect us at the Feast of Trumpets, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we all gather around the throne, he'll say, Dad, got her done. Got it done. I've been promising you for 2,000 years. I was the first fruits, and here's all the rest of them. Because my leaven was released in the earth. Oh, that is the spring feast, according to Mike Lake, and what he can see from the word of God for the Gentiles to observe. That's why we do things differently. But I mean, there's a lot of power in that. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you ever, it's like the guy coming around the corner, or the girl coming around the corner, how many know does dealing with the shadows a whole lot different than you walking up being able to hold her and kiss her? There's a whole lot, there's, there's some more substance to it, okay? And so we're dealing with the substance of what Jesus has done and incorporate them into the feast to add power to what we have. Because when it comes to the spring feast, I ain't messing with no shadows no more. I got the real deal. And so for me, it is Olam, but when the body has come, I've modified it, Jesus modified it, so that I can now remember, and we start the same process again. Every time I take communion, I remember what he has done so it prepares me for what he will do. Because it is a moadim that is also a divine rehearsal to prepare me for his second coming. Oh, man. Oh, my. You guys, just pray this with me this morning. Lord Jesus, I receive everything you did for me. You are the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. I put your blood over my doorpost. Let your blood cover every sin. 
You are the unleavened bread. You were pierced for me. You were striped for me. By your stripes I am healed. I receive that salvation. I receive that healing now. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, forgive me for ever doing anything that would take away from what you've done. But let me walk in the fullness of the cross and of the feasts and of your work. In Jesus' name. I just had fun. How about you guys? Does that make, does that make understanding for you guys?